What was that? Did Jesus say all those things? Okay, here's what. Okay, for the sake of those who are listening by the podcast, I have to I have to cut out the audio, you know, from that because that's copyrighted. So, so the podcast is basically going to begin like right now. And so we just got done watching a video portrayal of John chapter five. They've actually made these movies that the 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 entire script of the movie is the scriptures. No other words were added to it. And so I just, uh, this particular one is the book of John, and it's like two and a half hours long as they go through the whole thing. And I just edited out, chap, you know, the parts that, you know, we're not going to be covering today. So, yes, every word that was up there on that screen was from the Scripture. And we're going to go through that today. Did that strike you as different from what you pictured Jesus being? I didn't think he spoke for so long a time. He did. Yeah, and I, and I, w- I was thinking about uh, you know the uh, the controversy you know between him and 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 the and the uh, Jewish leaders, and I and you know there was controversy there. But as I read through this in the next few chapters, uh, I mean he is saying something. He is inciting up so much. These folks have so much hatred for him. You heard in there they said you know they were trying to kill him, and. It's just, it's just, you know, it's just, it's just amazing. Kind of, you know, I was, I was kind of thinking about President Trump and his tweets. How he tweets out something, and then the, the, uh, the political world goes bananas. You know, saying, "Oh, how can he say that? That's so hateful." Well, that's nothing new. I mean, I mean, if if, if there was Twitter back in Jesus' day, I can just imagine what he would be tweeting out. But look at what he was saying here. Um, but but the stuff that Jesus is giving us, um, you know, this whole chapter is just, you know, you know, of course, the whole book of John is just amazing. Uh, we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those are called the Synoptic Gospels. They all are so similar, you know, in, in, in the way they, they work. They, they cover a lot of the... Um, you know the, the ministry of Jesus out, you know, out in the uh, outer parts, away from Jerusalem. All the different healings, and you know, it's just absolutely wonderful stuff. John wrote his gospel much later in the, in, in in his life, and he. And it seems like what he did is he went back and he wanted to cover some of the things that the other gospels didn't really cover. He was very purposeful in what he was he was covering. Uh, it's been said that Matthew would be the gospel to the Jews because he's constantly saying that it was it, it, that he might be filled, fulfilled as it was written. He's constantly quoting the Old Testament. The book of Mark, they say, was written to the Romans. Romans were interested in action. And so you see immediately, 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 things happened. Luke was more of a historian, probably writing for the Greeks. In fact, Luke... And Acts, many believe, are, are actually a legal brief for the Apostle Paul when he was uh, about to go to trial before Rome, before the emperor. And then John wrote, again, much later, really, I think, filling in a lot of details. And I think John was actually written to Christians to fill in a lot of the detail. A lot of it is so, so very intimate. There's things in John that are just not covered very well in the other Gospels. And we'll, we'll, when we get into the later chapters, especially when we talk about uh, the foot washing, in John chapter 13 is not covered anywhere else. John 14, 15, and 16 are all, was the night before he was betrayed. Before he, was betrayed. he gave them uh, just like this inside, insider's briefing into what was to come, the church life, and so forth. And I think that John wanted us to have that. So let's go back into John chapter 5. We're going to go through basically verse by verse. There's some really cool insights here. And you'll say, yes, all those words, Jesus said them. So let's start at the top. John chapter one, 5, verse 1. And there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda having five porches. Bethesda, by the way, means house of mercy. What a cool name for this pool. And as you saw in the movie, in, the, in these lay a great multitude of sick people, 
the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. You saw in the movie the water bubbling up. And there are some scholars I've read that basically said that they, they, there were some like warm uh, uh, springs that would uh, release water and air into the, into the pool. And that was the stirring up that they, they saw there. Um, verse 4 says, For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. And that would basically explain why all these sick and lame people were laying there right at the pool. I imagine they jockeyed for that position right by the edge of the water. I, I really believe, you know, the scripture says there was an angel. It doesn't say they believed there was an angel. It says there was an angel. And I believe people were healed because why else would the lame people be laying on the edge of the pool? If nobody was healed, if it was just a superstition, they wouldn't just be laying there. So obviously people got healed. And I, and I, I thoroughly believe that. And as we read, now there was a certain man who had an infirmity for 38 years. That's how long he had been laying like that. That's a long time. It doesn't mean that he was 38 years old. It means that's how long he had this infirmity, whatever it was. So he may have been much older. Lifespans back then weren't that much longer than that. You know, when the, uh, when the priests, you know, the Levitical priests, they started their ministry at age 30. And according to the Old Testament law, at age 50, they retired. So he was laying there for 38 years. I love watching on the video there when this guy, he's just got this pained look at his face. He's trying to get up and, uh, somebody beat me. And I imagine he experienced that a lot. And then Jesus saw him lying there. And he knew already that he had been in that condition a long time. And he asked him a question. Do you want to be made well? My mind keeps thinking, duh. <laughs> but it's an honest question. It's a very good question. And I often think about some people who beg now. If somebody goes up to them and says, do you want to be healed of that? Well, no, because then I wouldn't get my uh, disability pay. I wouldn't get to sit here and, and beg from, from people. There were people who basically, because of their infirmity, that was their, that was their profession, was begging. And yet, if they, when Jesus healed them, now they've got to find a real job to do. And I often wonder if some people, do you want to be made well? You know, in fact, listen to the man's, man's response. This was a yes or no question. Do you want to be made well? Yes or no? What was he saying? Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And kind of like an excuse. It's an honest one. It's his issue. He, you know, he, I think he's implying, yes, I want to be healed, but I can't get into the pool. How often in our circumstances, God says, do you want this to happen? Oh, I can't, Lord. It's just, that's how we are sometimes. And I think it's wise and good to express to God our difficulties our complaints, as it were, you read through the Psalms, you will see so many places where the psalmist is just, shall we say, belly aching to God? Go ahead and tell it to God in prayer. He can handle it. And in the same way here, this man is telling Jesus his difficulty. I have no man to put me in the pool. And when the water stirred up, he, before I'm coming, nobody beats me to it. And Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. It must have been a, a moment there. Right after he said that, and as you saw in the movie, he reached down, he started to feel his legs, and he realized something was different. Oh, the look on his face must have been wonderful. 38 years he's been laying there. All of a sudden, parts are working. 
awesome. And just, I, I you know, the, the giddiness, the, you know, just, wow. Um, and immediately, no questions asked, no excuses given. Jesus tells him, take up your bed and walk. He gets up. What an awesome thing. And then we come to the problem. And that day was the Sabbath. The Pharisees, their big thing was the Sabbath day. There were so many laws that they had, they not only did, well, I mean, this is the day that God said, this is the day that you shall rest. This is the day for worship. It was supposed to be a blessing to us. But the Pharisees had written so many man-made rules and regulations about the Sabbath day, it, it, um, it just totally destroyed the joy of the day. That man who went up to him and, and, and talked to him, you know, he was like the morality police. And I was stationed over in Saudi Arabia during Desert Storm, and I saw the morality police. In fact, they gave us briefings. If you go into town, be warned, be wary of these guys. They are mean. They are out to, and in Saudi Arabia, obviously, it's, it's, it's Islamic law that they're, they're enforcing. I remember there was uh, one of the guys, I was in the, in the dorm there, and this was, uh, you, know, be, you know, before the war actually broke out, and one of the guys had managed to get one of those, you know, the headscarf things that kind of looked like a gingham uh, tablecloth that you see, especially the, the Palestinians wear. And he got one of those with the headband. And he says, wow, this is really cool. I think I'm going to wear this downtown. Oh, no. <laughs> that would have been disastrous. All his friends were saying, no, don't do it. You'll get in trouble. Don't do it. You'll get in trouble. And I stood up with my five stripes on my arm, and I said, you are not going. That's an order. Probably saved his life. So in the same way, the Pharisees would patrol around town looking for infractions of their rules. And we see that happening here. It says that, therefore, the Jews said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. It was probably just a mat, just like they showed in the movie. And then he just answered them. Well, he who made me well said, take up your bread and walk. And I think what he was kind of saying or implying is to say, hey, hey, look, the man who has the power to heal me told me to do this, so I'm going to do that. I think he was kind of like, you know, almost sticking his face as, you know, hey, this man greater than you. He told me to do this, so I'm going to do that. I love the way he just kind of walked away. <laughs> that was cool. Um, he answered him, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. And then they asked him, well, who is the man who said, take up your bed and walk? And I think it was kind of implying, who is the man who dares to violate our authority and tell you to do that? And this was one of those, I don't know, moments. But the man who was healed did not know who he was, for Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Have you noticed so, so, how so many so-called faith healers would be standing there in the in, in the in the flood in the spotlight, you know, taking all the glory in? Jesus didn't do that. He just kind of snuck away. Afterward, verse fourteen, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, "See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you." Always coming back to repentance. We need to live our life for him. And the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. Well, they asked him a question. He didn't know who it was. Jesus came by, told him this. And he figured he was doing the right thing. And as far as I know, he was. And then you notice, verse 16. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him. Because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Big power trip. The fact that Jesus healed this man after 38 years of being sick meant nothing to them. There was one healing that Jesus did in one of the other Gospels 
where the man with the withered hand and the, the ruler of the synagogue stood up and he says, all right, everybody, six days you can come back here and get healed. Just don't bother on the Sabbath day. Their petty rules were more important to them than the fact that this man was healed. And I think this is a good thing to look in the mirror and say, Lord, is this me? Do I have petty rules that are keeping me from worshiping you? Things that I do. Good question to ask sometime. Just ask God to, to reveal it to you if there is. And this is where Jesus stood up and started really, you know, and you can see the anger. You know, I mean, I'm sure Jesus was proclaiming these things and the crowd was just, they were angry at him. And, he's, and he, uh, he says, Jesus answered them and says, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Working was forbidden on the Sabbath day. Here, Jesus is actually starting to make a claim of deity. He's trying to tell us who he is as the Son of God. How he is 100% God and 100% man at the same time. These are doctrinal things that he's giving us, and this is good to, to take note of. He says, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him. They were wanting to kill him just over this statement. That's how angry they were. That's how bitter, and religion will do that. It'll cause you to stir up all kinds of hate. I remember reading this thing Decades ago, um, I think all of us are old enough to remember who Tiny Tim was. The guy with the ukulele singing, tiptoe through the tulips. Well, somebody, there was a church conference and they, somebody had mentioned, hey, I heard a rumor that Tiny Tim got saved. And this pastor's wife says, oh, no. And then she realized what she said. <laughs> now, I don't know how true that was, but it's, it's, it's kind of revealing. We might hear about a, a, a famous sinner, you know, some rock star or what have you, getting saved. And we think, no, oh, no, what is the, there goes the neighborhood of the church. No, wait a minute, that, that's what we're out here for. That's why we have the name New Life. That's why we, we're proclaiming new life in, you know, in, in, in this community through Jesus Christ. We want to see people who are the, shall we say, the dregs of society. Actually, anybody. We want to see them come and get saved. We have a message for them. And so Jesus is proclaiming, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father, making himself equal to God. I've heard people say, Well, Jesus never anywhere proclaimed to be God. Um, read on. Read on. Uh, you'll discover that the, the Jews understood what he was trying to say. Jesus is also giving us a hint into the Trinity. My father, me. You'll notice he's saying, and you'll, you'll see this here where it says, um, Jesus answered verse 9 and said, Most assuredly I say to you, the son, of God, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. See the, the, the unity here? As the father loves the son and shows him all things he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. This is the Trinity in, in working. We see this uh, unity of purpose. Verse 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. There is life in Jesus' name. That's another big, wonderful piece of good news. He says, for the Father raises the dead and gives life to them. Even so, the Son gives life to the, him to whom he will. New life in Christ. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. So when every one of us, when we stand before God in, in judgment, and yes, there is a judgment for Christians. It's different from people who are lost. There are two, two judgments. When old Muhammad stands before the throne it won't be Allah up there on the throne it will be Jesus <laughs> and for all of us for you know it's, it's, it's going to be Jesus on the throne and it will be Jesus who will be passing judgment Psalms 2 says kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way and his, when his wrath is kindled but a little blessed are those who put their trust in him 
Verse 22 says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. And he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And I think those religious leaders understood that he was talking to them. If you don't honor me, he said, you're not honoring the Father. And you heard in the movie that the, the crowd with the, you know, the, you know, the anger just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a scene we don't normally see or think about. But, um, but it, says, uh, it says, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Um, Peter, in Acts 2, stood up and told the crowd, this is, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. That is Acts 4.12, if you're taking notes. Verse 24 here. Most assuredly, I looked up the Greek, the Greek words. He is actually saying, amen, amen. Every time you see the words, most assuredly, in the King James, verily, verily, uh, New American Standard, truly, truly, the Greek word is amen, amen, which basically means it is true, it is done, that's what the word means. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, and he shall not come into judgment, but has been passed from death to life. You see the transition there? You put your faith in Jesus, you are passed from death unto life. Verse 25. Most assuredly, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is... When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. We will see when we get to chapter 11, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. What a scene that was when he's standing there in front of the open grave. All the people just kind of standing around. And he yells, Lazarus, come forth. Why did he yell, Lazarus, come forth? Because if he had simply said, come forth, all the bodies in the grave would have risen. There's power in the name of Jesus. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear it will live, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. So the Father has life, the Son has life. And verse 27, it says, And has given him, the Son, authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. He has authority, he has life. Do not marvel at this, because the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. And then come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Two raptures. If you're taking notes, First Thessalonians four thirteen through eighteen talks about the rapture of you know, where where he comes in the clouds and with the trump of God and the voice of the archangel, whoosh, up we go. Won't that be fun? I think it will be. And think of the, the shock of the world. And then in Revelation 20, talks about the great white throne and how the dead are raised. The sea gives up the dead that are in it. I believe that all those who were, who were cremated, that God is very able to bring together the ashes to re recreate their body. And they will all come to the great white throne for judgment. And there they will be standing, and the books will be opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead there were judged according to the things that were written in the books. Every thought, every deed, everyone has ever done is written down. There were times when I used to when I used to preach this, and I and I would I would say, you know, let's just pretend like I only sinned three times a day. And you wrote, if you wrote down those those sins for my life, 
That, that would be you know, only three times a day. That's not, that's not too bad. And then I brought out one of the, you remember those great big uh, unabridged dictionaries, the ones that were about this thick? And at the time, I had calculated up how, old, how many days old I was. And I brought this thing out, and I, and I drop it on the ground. Thud! I don't have one anymore. Otherwise, I would have brought it to do that. And I said, that would have been volume one of 14 volumes. There were like 2,500 pages in each of those dictionaries. And for the number of days I old, old I was back then, I've obviously lived a lot longer, it would have taken 14 volumes to write down each sin if I only sinned three times a day. The dead were judged out of the things, out of the books. And then it says there was another book, the Lamb's Book of Life. And whoever's name was not written in the Lamb's Book of Life was cast into the lake of fire. I got news for you. I see so many Christian productions, movies, what have you, that portray the devil as being the king of hell. Wrong. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that he will be a prisoner in hell. That, is, that will be his eternal domain. He's not in charge of it. He will be tormented there. I think that's good news. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of the condemnation. I can do nothing, uh, excuse me, I of myself can do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. The Father gives the Son all judgment, but the ju Son does not judge on his own. He listens to what the Father says. So you see the unity and purpose and the rightness. Let's face it, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, being God, they're omniscient. They know everything. They're all powerful, which is omni and omnipotent, and they're all every, omni uh, omnipresent. They're everywhere. They have these attributes, and being God without sin, of course, they're going to operate in unity, which is absolutely amazing. And then Jesus gives four witnesses that were tr that testify as to who He is. And he tells him right there, he says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Literally what that means is it's not like uh, admissible in court. So if I just give, stand up and tell you my opinion, well, that, that's not admissible. You, know, you have to have other witnesses. Even in the Old Testament law, no one is condemned except by the, by, by the account of two or three witnesses. So Jesus gives his testimony here. There is another who bears witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, talking about John the Baptist, and he has borne witness to the truth. The Pharisees sent representatives to John in the River Jordan, and they asked him about, who are you? I am not the Christ. I am not that prophet. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. They sent to John to see, to. And, and John testified to us, look, there's one coming after me, talking about Jesus. He says, he says, yet, um, he says, yet you have sent to John, he bore witness to the truth, yet I do not receive testimony from men, but I say the things that you may be saved. See his purpose there? Even when he was riling up their, you know, getting them all angry, he was saying it for their salvation purposes. God is not willing that any should be that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what God wants. And in this particular case, it's kind of sad that God doesn't get what He wants. He gives us free will as well. So it's you know, He calls us, and we respond by repenting. He says, John, verse thirty-five. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in His life. But I have a greater witness than John's for the works which my father has given me to finish the very works that I do bear witness of me that the father has sent me. You know, things like telling a guy at the pool, rise up and walk, carry your mat, um, going up to blind people and healing them. 
Did you know Jesus ruined every funeral he ever went to? I mean, raising up the guest of honor at a funeral is just not very polite society here. I mean, Lazarus, he rose him up from the dead. The, 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 the widow at, at, at Nain, when his, her son was laid out in the casket, he goes up, touches the casket, get up and walk. Uh, you know, you know the, Jairus' daughter raised, raised her up from the dead. Just, he just ruined every funeral. I mean, what a party pooper, I'll tell you. And then he says in verse 37, And the Father himself who sent me testifies of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. If you think about it, and if you're taking notes, I know there's people on the podcast who are. Matthew 3.17, Matthew 17.5, Mark 1.11, Luke 3.22. The Father says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Four times it recorded the Father's voice shouting out from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in Him I am well pleased. How cool is that? He says, verse 38, But you do not have His word abiding in you, because whom He sent, Him you do not believe. You search the Scriptures. You see that where He grabbed that scroll? I love the way they portray that. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have an eternal life, but these testify of me, Jesus said. But you were not willing to come to me, that you may have life. You know, it's not lack of knowledge that keeps people away from Jesus. It's pride. Think about it. When you come to Jesus... You have to repent. Father, I have sinned grievously against you. That's a big pill to swallow. It's a big pill to swallow to admit, I can't do anything of my own to save. That's why the cults have such a, that's a, an appeal. They might even say, yes, Jesus will wash away your sins, but you've got to bring a little something yourself. We're kind of like the, the, the rich guy who, who um, has all this gold. And he's telling, and, and it's like when, he, when it was time for him to die, he, he tells the angel, he says, can, can I bring my gold with me? And in this story, he says, yeah, you can bring your gold with him. So here he comes, he's got suitcases full of gold. Comes up to the throne. Boom. What you got in the bags? He opens up the bag and he pulls out all this gold. It's shiny, it's bright, and it's brilliant. And the Lord looks at him and says, You brought pavements. <laughs> the Bible talks about streets of gold. <laughs> but everything's perfect here. We don't even have potholes for you to fill in. <laughs> it's a big pill to swallow that says, There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. We just have to come to Him in faith. And these. Pharisees, these scribes, had the attitude that they were so righteous that God owed them favors. And here Jesus is saying, that's not like that at all. Verse 40, But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. Verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. We read in the Bible that when Antichrist comes, the Jews will welcome him. He comes in his own name. And eventually they will regret it because he will then go into the temple, stand in the place where God is supposed to be, and proclaim himself God. It is at that moment that the Jews will realize, I've been duped. He says, if another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and you do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Matthew twenty five twenty three is when God says to the servant, well done, you good and faithful servant, for you have been faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much. Those are the rewards 
If we're faithful in little things, we will be faithful in much. Verse 45. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. Oh man, did they get riled up over that one. For if you had believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? We see a good example of that. The story of the rich man and Lazarus. When the rich man is in hell and he's begging Abraham, um, he says, and uh, this is for, the, for if you're taking notes again, Luke 16, starting with verse 27, he says, Then he said, I beg you, therefore, my father, if you would send him, talking about Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they come to this place of torment. Abraham said to them, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, that, and he said No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And that's why I preach the Bible. You see so many of these churches, you know, they're on the TV, they're on radio, they're, they're, um, you listen to them, pop psychology, marketing methods, um, they talk about social justice, we've got to feed the poor. Well, yes, that's part of it. But it's Jesus and his word. I saw an article recently talking about how oh, the, the, the church in America is at its all-time low percentage-wise. And I got to thinking, I think more of what it is is, is, is those stats are becoming more honest. Because the Bible talks about, Jesus said that, you know, wide is the gate that leads, leads to destruction. Narrow Straight, as the old King James says, straight means hard, is the way that leads unto life. I believe that truly born-again Christians have always been and always will be the minority because of what he said. And so if they're talking about the churches, are there's more, less percentage of people who claim to be Christians, I think they're just being more honest, to be real honest. And... The rise is a big, huge rise of the number of people who say, I'm either atheist or I'm just nothing. I'm just eh, I don't care. And so there's folks who study church growth methods. You know, what what ways, what things can you do to to grow a church? This is how we get some of these mega pastors who are preaching to 25,000 or more, telling them things like, you can have your best life now. You've got a miracle in your mouth. All this blah, 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 blah. But the churches that are really, truly growing are the ones who teach the Bible. Jesus here said, they have Moses and the prophets. If you don't believe these, these scriptures speak of Jesus. That's what I want to preach. I want to preach the word of God that leads people to Jesus. And that is the message that I have. That Jesus came, he lived a sinful, excuse me, lived a sinless Got to get the right words out there. Obviously, I need to edit that in <laughs> the podcast. He died a life without sin, obeyed every law perfectly, and yet he was arrested, tried, condemned, died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried 
and rose again, again according to the scriptures, that we might have eternal life. Years ago, there was a guy who was a famous tightrope walker. You've heard this story before. You'll probably hear it again. And he would, uh, they, they, they had big, huge things. This was like decades and decades ago, long before I was born. Stretched the tightrope across Niagara Falls. And he would go across, you know, the people on both sides are, wow, this is really, really cool. This, you know, and... And then he got a wheelbarrow. <laughs> he's, they took the uh, tire off, the, the rubber tire off, so that the wheelbarrow would go on the wire. But he's walking across with this wheelbarrow across Niagara Falls. And he comes back, and the manager's got on the microphone. He says, ladies and gentlemen, how many of you believe that this man could carry somebody in the wheelbarrow safely across Niagara Falls? Yeah! I believe, I believe. May I have a volunteer? Crickets. In the same way, Jesus is saying, I can carry you to eternal life if you will put your trust in me. And Jesus is saying, will you get in his wheelbarrow? That's the type of trust and when you get in the wheelbarrow, there's nothing you have to do but rest and trust and let him carry you across. When we read about the rich man and Lazarus, the Bible says that the Lazarus died and angels carried him to this place they called Abraham's bosom. We know now that since Jesus died and he led captivity captive, he went into this place, Abraham's bosom, and he carried all the righteous into his presence. It says, Lazarus was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died and he was buried. And next thing we know, he's in torment. And so here's the call. If you will recognize your sin, that you have not kept the Ten Commandments, how could we? I've got probably 20, 25 volumes of sins or more. Yet Jesus died on the cross to wash away my sin and he washed away your sin but you have to put your faith and trust in him. And so I invite you to bow your head and say Lord Jesus I am I am horrible. I'm a horrible sinner. And I invite you to tell him all about it. Confess your sin. But to repent means to then change your, your thinking and to change what you're doing and let him change you let him come in let him give you eternal life let him wash away your sin thank you Jesus for doing that and as we put our faith and trust in you let us follow you as disciples all the days of our lives and we give you glory now in Jesus name Amen. Can you say amen? Oh, hallelujah. <laughs>